Welcome to our second featured speaker today and all of you that are attending by live stream internet we welcome you back and all of you that are live here in the audience get ready for one of the most remarkable speakers John is John is truly one of my heroes I know I am embarrassing sometime but I will tell you a true story years ago when I had just had my spiritual awakening. I had a series of dreams and a visitation, and I was told that I had had an association with the Apostle John during the time of Jesus, and that I would meet this man one day. And I believe that I have met this man. Uh, last year, some of you went with us to Greece, and we went to the island of Patmos, where John wrote the book of Revelations. And this is a copy of Revelations from that place. And I'd like to present it to the man, I think, that wrote it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. The Edgar Casey Foundation and the Association of Research and Enlightenment uh, are one of the most amazing organizations on the planet. Uh, I had the honor of speaking there in October and again in April. And these are wonderful, grounded people that are based in Virginia Beach, and we invited them to be here. And so all of John's amazing books are available in the Earthkeeper store. And we have a group from the ARE that are taking memberships. And so I can't think of a better metaphysical organization to be associated with in the Association for Research and Enlightenment.
I'd like to urge you all to take time to sign up and become a member. You get a fantastic magazine. You get articles that are, are written by John Van Auken. You get discounts on books and discounts on their amazing events. So I asked John today if he would speak about the celestial origins of mankind based on the Casey readings. And this is a fantastic presentation. You don't want to miss it. And a big standing round of applause for John Van Auken, one of my heroes. Thank you, John. All right. Thank you so much, James. That was above and beyond. <laughs> Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with uh, Edgar Cayce, but for the, those of you who are not, uh, I'll just briefly give you a little idea because I'm going to present a lot of material uh, from him as a source. When he was a uh, young child, he uh, demonstrated abilities that were uh, unusual. He did not know that at the time. He thought everybody did what came naturally to him. But as he grew, he realized that this wasn't the case. And um, his abilities grew and developed. And by the time he was a mature man, he was a, an amazing source of information and enlightenment. He had to do it from an unconscious state. And the discourses that came through him said if he would become more spiritual he could do them consciously <laughs> uh, when you see what came through him I don't know what would have come through him if he had become more spiritual but when he was a little guy like uh, I'll just give you a couple examples uh, one day his father was testing testing him on the spelling quiz for tomorrow and he didn't know any of the words and his father became upset, and the little boy said, Listen, Dad, if you'll let me sleep on that spelling book for about 15 minutes, I'll know the words. Now, yeah, I had three kids, and they tried everything with me. <laughs> I've honestly wondered what I would have done if one of those buggers had said that to me. I would hope I would have done what his dad did, said, Okay, kid, you got 15 minutes. And he walked away. Little Edgar put the book behind his head, reclined on the couch, and in 15 minutes his father came back and said, okay, let's see about this hocus pocus stuff. And he knew every word on the page how to spell it. And then he told his dad, dad, I, just, I don't just know the words on that page. I know the words in the entire book and what page they're on. It's like he had a photographic memory of this spelling book. Well, he saw auras, uh, he picked up psychic uh, feelings from people. He played with angels, fairies, sprites, little people. Um, and uh, most of the time his mother couldn't see them and it broke his heart. He cried a lot because he didn't want his mother to think he was a liar. Well, one day she was washing the dishes and looked out the window and saw all the little people playing with her son. And he was so happy, his life changed dramatically. And he and his mother, whom he loved dearly, uh, built a new relationship. In fact, on another day, she was looking out the window, but Edgar was in the house. And she saw all the angels and said, Edgar, your friends want to play with you. <laughs> and uh, so where his ability really became a channel of help to others was when he lost his own voice when he was around 20 years of age. And he went around town with a little notepad like this, and that's how he could communicate, because he couldn't talk. Well, uh, he was getting tired of this, and uh, there was a hypnotist uh, in town, and so he went there and asked the guy if he could help him. And this uh, poor guy hypnotized Edgar Casey, and suddenly Edgar, a voice came through that said, direct this body to channel all the blood flow to the throat, and when the throat becomes blood red, direct it to rebalance circulation in the body for normal functioning. Well, the hypnotist was shocked. First, this guy couldn't talk. 
And here he was talking in a booming voice. So he did it. He said the words and Edgar's uh, throat became blood red. And the hypnotist started to get afraid he was going to lose this guy. So he quickly did rebalance the circulation. And from then on, Edgar Casey could talk. Now that spooked the whole town. He lived in little Hopkinsville, Kentucky. Uh, and the whole town realized, you know the kid that can't talk? He's talking. And apparently it happened during hypnosis. Well, there was a local doctor who had a patient that he really cared about, but he had run out of ideas. He knew no other thing he could do to help this patient. So he secretly asked the hypnotist to hypnotize Edgar Casey and see if he could do it. And here, under this state of trance, Edgar saw the woman's entire body, all the chemistry of the body, the electrical patterns, the history of injuries to the body, and diagnosed her condition and, and uh, gave uh, a uh, course of action that healed the woman. Well, that caused all sorts of trouble. From then on, he became nicknamed a psychic diagnostician. That's a mouthful. And he was doing what are now called the health readings for years, years. None of this stuff yet. Until one day he was in uh, Ohio and he told this one man about his physical illness and was trying to help him. And the man became upset. And he said, well, why do I have this illness? Edgar from trance said, because as a monk in a previous life in France, you abuse the body and this is the karma of that situation. <laughs> and yeah, everybody went, what? And we started what are nicknamed the life readings, the life discourses, in which he would read your soul's past lives. Well, from there spun out these ideas of who we really are, celestial beings, and our whole journey as souls. And we got into all this fantastic stuff about Atlantis, Lemuria, and all of that. And that's how it exploded into what we have today. There are over 14,000 readings, and as an ARE member, you can access them online and search any word you want. Punch in angels, you'll get about 300 readings on angels. So uh, it's exploded, and I am going to share with you some of the major concepts of who we really are, our celestial origins, and where we're headed. And it's a lot different story than you might think but most of you are i'm like talking to the choir here most of you know this stuff so here we go first off you must understand that despite the appearance of being physical we are actually composed of stardust and this is not a mystic like me talking this is physics scientists are saying this we are stardust here is Dr. Lawrence Krauss, a physicist, and here's what he has to tell you that is so amazing. Every atom in your body came from a star that exploded, and the atoms in your left hand are prob probably came from a different star than the atoms in your right hand. It is really the most poetic thing I know about the universe. You are all stardust. You couldn't be here if stars hadn't exploded because the elements, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and all the things that matter for evolution were not created at the beginning of time. They were created in stars. So forget Jesus, stars died so you could live. <laughs> Now, of course, Dr. Lawrence is talking about your body and Jesus is talking about your soul. <laughs> but he has got the thing nailed as far as our physical bodies being stardust. Edgar Cayce comes along and says, our true nature is as light. A ray that does not end, lives on and on until it becomes one in essence with the source of light. I just love this slide. There's some part in me that has something like a memory feeling as I watch this, like, oh yeah, and I'd love to do that again. We are rays of light, and we came out of the source of light, and we are experiencing life and heading back towards that source of light. 
many sources from the ancient times, including biblical, say that our life began in infinity. At the moment, light was conceived in the infinite mind and that that light was the light of consciousness. So here you see the, the prototype of light, the logos, the first con concept of light as consciousness, and it conceived millions of points of consciousness, countless actually, and I think this little one right here is me. I've often, <laughs> see that? <clears throat> All of us in this room, and amazingly, the same thing happens in Mayan, Toltec, Aztec legends. Um, the great winged serpent god calls all the children of God into heaven together and says, children, darkness has fallen. We must all put our hearts into this effort and creates the sacred fire. And all the children of God go up and they put their hearts into it. Then they run to the edge of heaven and look down and in the universe, they see all the stars come out. Every star, according to ancient Egyptians and ancient Mayan, Toltec, Aztecs, is a specific soul's heart intention in this journey of enlightenment. There is a star out there that is you and me. It's an amazing, and this goes way back in ancient legends. It is our celestial conscious. Now, of course, we began as an immature psyche, conceived in the womb of the infinite, and now with free will, we were to set off on a journey of enlightenment and grow and learn. Edgar Cayce tells it this way. The purpose of the heart is to know yourself, to be yourself, and yet one with God. He's not talking intellectually. You must conceive this in the womb of your consciousness. Just state it, grow it, and then you must dilate your heart and mind to deliver the real you, this celestial you, this divine you, and become one with the entire creation and God. Very similar to the two great commandments, love God with all your being and love your neighbor as yourself. The paradox is Jesus says the second commandment's like the first. It's not like the first. Have you met these people? God, God understands me. I love God. God loves me and all my little issues. The people. How can that be like the first? Until you realize that the God you're having an intimate relationship with includes all of them and loves all of them and doesn't want to lose any of them, even as Jesus said, the least among us. Yikes. He told this one kid was coming to him and getting a lot of readings about yoga breath and kundalini movement. He was having altered experiences and all. And Edgar from trance, and let me show you how he used to do it. He would lie down and put his hand over his third eye and he would see a point of light. As the light appeared, he would then move his hands over his solar plexus and he would go into deep breathing and rim, rapid eye movement. And you had to give him the suggestion right then or he'd fall asleep on you, have a dream, wake up later, no reading. See, So his wife would watch him and as he went into rim and deep breathing, she'd say, you will have before you the inquiring mind of Mary Smith, uh, Bob Jones, stuff like this. And the light would move and he would move with the light. And he would come to where he saw the book of life of whomever Gertrude had named. And in the book of life, if he turned the pages this way, he could look into their future. If he turned it this way, he could look into their past. And the keeper of the books of life, or the Akashic record, many of you know about, would tell him what he could say and what he could not say. Because there were stages, and what were we focusing on in one incarnation might be sufficient. You don't want to tell too much. They got to focus on this right now, you see? And that's the way it works. So. Here was this young kid getting all the kundalini guidance and everything, and he was blowing chakras open and having wonders. And Edgar interrupts him and says, you know, you think it's great to be one of the children of God. It's far greater to be one with them. You're building a heaven all by yourself, and you're not going to want to be there when you get there. 
it's time to go out and work and live among them as disgusting as that may be to you. <laughs> this second reading, the purpose is that you might know yourself to be yourself and yet one with the creative forces or God. See, for Edgar Cayce, the creative forces were the essence of God. The destructive forces were the misuse of free will of the created. The, they weren't part of the initial essence of the creator. They were in the process of allowing the created to make mistakes, to misuse free will. Um, but ultimately, all of that would be cleansed up. So you see, as you become more creative, rather than saying things to another person that are destructive, or bring down self-worth, you're actually giving uplifting things to another person, you're in the creative forces. And the more often you are, the more you become one with the creative forces. Do you see? And yourself, don't forget, you judge yourself pretty hard sometimes. When you start doing destructive thoughts, destructive analysis of yourself, you are harming yourself and limiting your ability. When you start giving the creative, the, the positive and creative and uplifting, you're moving towards your godly nature. But uh, now we're eternal beings, so you see the last reading is really important since he's talking to an eternal soul. Don't put the material first, for you have to live with yourself a long, long while. If you're immortal, and you are, realize how long you're going to be with yourself. <laughs> and he's saying to you, become acquainted with yourself. Know yourself and the relationship to the creative forces. You see? These, this is the mission. And the process of self-enlightenment and realization is called, among uh, depth psychologists, individuation. It's a big process. So all of us are the light beings... And we're in this journey of using our will and our consciousness, the gift we were given, to come to really know the uniqueness. At the moment that the Creator conceived you, there was a uniqueness to the Creator's motivation for you. And you need to discover you. Do you see? That essence, at the moment the Creator conceived you, is what you're going for because that's going to fulfill your heart and mind because you have struck what you really are, who you really are. Here's a definition. Individuation is the process whereby the innate elements of individualness, the different experiences of a soul, life, and the soul life includes uh, reincarnation, but also celestial soul journeys between incarnations. Edgar doesn't say rest in peace. Edgar says get to work on the other side. <laughs> when you die in the first 10 minutes, Edgar says, your self becomes alarmed. Oh my gosh, I don't have vocal cords to vibrate their eardrums. Oh my gosh, I'm not reflecting light off the surface of my body's skin so their cones and rods in their eyes see me and yet I'm here and it, it starts to slip back into its deeper self and when it slips into that consciousness it starts to pick up on more of what it needs to do and it gets connected to a, an impulse from the universal consciousness that motivates you towards the next stage of growth soul growth so you're not just idle now, it is true, uh, I have uh, grandchildren and children, so let's say I pass on. As I start this, I may have heart feelings and concerns not to leave them alone behind. You can do both. Believe it or not, you're not as, as restricted in a body as I am here. My mind can actually be working on celestial soul growth while loving and paying attention and whispering to them what they might need or be seeking even manifest to them in a dream if they need comfort from dad or granddad. You see what I mean? It's, we're much more capable of multitasking in the spirit than we are in the physical. Uh, so different experiences of a soul's life and the different aspects and components of the immature psyche. Latent within us are 
the fundamentals to help us become all we can be. And I'm not talking about joining the army there. Uh, some of you know the commercial, some of you don't anyway. Becoming integrated over time into a well-functioning whole. This is individuation. You are working on a process of integration of a lot of aspects as you find your true self and become the great be celestial being you were intended to be. Now, Edgar Cayce recommended the philosopher, mystic Ospensky. And here's Ospensky on this mission of individuation. Our aim is to become one, to have one permanent I. But in the beginning, work means to be more and more divided. You must realize how far you are from being one. And only when you know all these fractions of yourself can work begin on one or more principal eyes around which unity can be built. It would be wrong understanding to unify all the things you find in yourself now the new I is something you do not know at present. It grows from something you can trust. At first, in separating false personality from you, try to divide yourself into what you can call reliable and what you find unreliable. And if you get married, your spouse will help you find those real fast. <laughs> If you give birth to those cute little children, they will grow up and point right at your unreliable elements of your character <laughs> real fast. Your friends will, especially those who really love you and are open, colleagues, employers, employees. Oh, it was a great resume. What have I done? These will bring out those elements in yourself. It's all set up, arranged to have you get into situations. Now, you will call them challenges, but the soul calls them opportunities. <laughs> I married my opportunity. <laughs> In ancient Egypt, they considered us to be star godlings even though they were incarnate in physical bodies and the body beautiful was one of their fundamental principles, they knew that even the most beautiful body was fundamentally a celestial being inside, a star godling of the great God. The star god is the magical, radiant, most essential portion of one's being, and they called it the Aku. It lives among the stars and was, in fact, a specific star, as I told you. It unites with the gods, lives among them, imperishable forever. In order for this starlight being to come alive, one's soul, the Egyptian word is Ba, and one's spirit twin, Egyptian word Ka, must unite. You must unite soul and spirit to give birth to your star being, your Aku. This union required many carefully executed steps to be taken and many tests to be overcome. But when the union occurred, the Aku was magically liberated and alive forever. Beautiful concept about us. We are star beings in the making. It is our destiny. You cannot turn away from it. So you are heading in that direction. Here's Edgar Casey again on us as star beings. As an entity passes on from this present time or this solar system, this sun, these forces, it passes through the various spheres on and on through the eons of time and, or space leading first into the central force known as Arcturus. Arcturus is a star, and in the 20s and 30s, Edgar Cayce was talking about stargates before we got the movie and the great TV series. <laughs> and he said the stargate for all of us in this solar system, for our souls, was the star Arcturus near the Pleiades. Eventually, an entity passes into the inner forces, inner sense, 
and then they may again, after a period of 10,000 years, enter into the earth to make manifest, to actually live what you have been studying, becoming, practicing, make manifest those forces gained in its passage through the stellar spheres. In entering, the entity takes on those forms that may be known in the dimensions of that plane which it occupies. There being not only three dimensions as of the Earth, but there may be seven as in Mercury, or four in Venus, or five in Jupiter. There may be only one as in Mars. There may be many more as in those of Neptune, or they may become even as nil until purified in Saturn's fires. Let me explain this to you. Edgar called these planetary sojourns, and he said, when we look out with the cones and rods in our three-dimensional eyes and see physical planets in the solar system, they are three-dimensional representations of multi-dimensional realms where souls are also active. There are no souls in incarnate bodies on the surface of these three-dimensional objects, only on the Earth planet. But your soul gets involved out there. And he explained this as a series of colleges within the university of the solar system. Each planet, using classical astrology, represented a college that focused on one essence of your growth. And now I'll name a planet and you tell me what the study is. Mercury. The mind. Venus. Eh, you guys know it all already, you see. But remember he said one dimension in Mars? What is Mars in Edgar Cayce's lexicon? Madness, temper, rage. Everyone has the potential. Everyone must learn to control it. Do you remember George Patton felt he incarnated from Mars with the power of the Martian energy to conquer anything before him? Um, you must, every soul must learn how to control the excessive use of their free will to dominate another. And many of Casey's karmic readings were about souls who use their will to crush the will of another and the karma coming back and experiencing it on the opposite end of that. Earth, of course, is the causal dimension. Oh, you think you're this way? We have a place where you can prove it. Cause and effect. What you do comes back around on you. And interestingly, the high school kids have the saying, what goes around? That's right, comes around. They know karma right off the bat. Oh, Saturn. Saturn, he said, is where all inadequate flesh goes to be redone. Ooh. Not a vacation spot. But he gave a reading for this one lady. He said, oh, here's a soul who's gone to Saturn often, and God loves one who's willing to start over. <laughs> Neptune, of course, is the mystic. Uranus is the psychic. Jupiter is high-mindedness, large groups. Venus is love one to another. Uh, Jupiter is love of the large groups and everything. And I'll give you an example how it affects a soul. The soul Edgar Casey, before he incarnated, sojourned in the dimensions, don't tell anybody John said on the surface of Uranus, promise me that. In the dimensions of Uranus, psychic development but also the extremes. Any of you who know astrology, Uranus, the extremes. As he came to the earth to incarnate, his soul did a brief sojourn in the dimensions of Venus, and he developed his love for people one-to-one, -one, and he gave psychic readings one-to-one. -one. You see how that worked? But like, for example, when he incarnated, he was a terrific psychic, but extreme. For example, you may not know this, he was a chain smoker. Now, you might not know what that is, but it's where you light the next cigarette off the present cigarette. Also, the copier ran out of paper one day, and the people went in and said, Edgar, the copier's out of paper. And about two hours later, a truck showed up with two years' worth of paper on it. And they told the driver, look, this is a mistake. We just need a ream. <laughs> that was Edgar Casey, okay? <laughs> Terrific psychic, but he also suffered from some of the weaknesses of Uranus and some of the weaknesses of Venus. His sister, however, 
Her soul sojourned in the dimensions of Jupiter before incarnating. High-mindedness, high ideals, large groups, the masses, right? And she had a brief sojourn in the dimensions of Mercury as she was coming to incarnate. Mental development, logistics, uh, order, reason, right? She incarnates and she becomes a top executive of the International Red Cross. Dealing with masses, the logistics of moving food and medicine and people. And see, that's how it actually works. Uh, previous sojourns affect your present incarnation because of what your soul learned there and is trying to apply here. So this is how Casey saw it all working together. Casey said that our taking on many forms in many different dimensions and spheres helps us to experience the whole of our being and of our creator's consciousness. He said that self is lost in that of attaining for itself the nearer and nearer approach that builds in manifested form. In other words, really, you are living it. It's manifest in you. Whether in the Pleiades, Arcturus, Gemini, or in Earth, in Vulcan, or in Neptune. So really, your journey is building on all of this. Here's a quote from the Egyptian Book of the Dead. It was carved on the walls of uh, Pepe the First Pyramid. And it's very esoteric in its uh, story. So I'll just read it for you. I've translated the names into what they mean literally in Egyptian. A creative essence appears out of the infinite, dark nothingness, willing itself into being. This essence evolved into a creator called the Complete One, Atem or Atum or Tem. Within the Complete One was its hidden portion, which was the infinite womb named Mother of the First Gods, who was also Grandmother of the Subsequent Gods. You get the idea? She's Mother. Period. The two of them conceived breath and moisture, the beginning of physical life. Sadly, these two offsprings were lost in the infinite dark nothingness. So then the eye of light that penetrates, penetrates the darkness was conceived to find the lost primordial children. The eye of light was Ra, pronounced Re by the Egyptians. When Ray rose from the hidden depths of the primordial sea, he immediately conceived, uh, gave life to Ma'at, the female goddess of truth. Ancient Egyptians believed that the creation could not have come into existence until truth, Ma'at, first established order, balance, and harmony. The Egyptians believed that if truth had not been conceived, then chaos would have reigned and the primordial mother would have reclaimed the manifested universe into her infinite womb. We have these magnificent stories. Here is a disciple uh, writing in the first verses of his gospel this rather esoteric concept. In the beginning was the word. Now, if you read this in the original Greek, that is not the English word. The word there is the Greek word logos, and translating it as word misleads you into thinking it's less than what the Logos means in Greek. Logos is the central essence of all consciousness. And the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. See how the author's trying to convey a very difficult concept. There was no separation. They were one. So with the Creator, and was the Creator, but was a unique essence of consciousness. This one was in the beginning with God. Now, if you read an English Bible, it's going to say he. But I read it in the original Greek. There is no masculine pronoun whatsoever. Every time that occurs, it says this one. So, ladies, you're included in this. <laughs> this one was in the beginning with God. All things were made through this one. And without this one was not anything made that was made. In this one was life, and the life was the light, here we go again, of humanity. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So here you find, even in biblical texts, the secret being released in the cryptic sort of passage. Edgar Cayce said, Spirit is the natural, the normal condition of an entity. 
When I read this, I was 24 years old and I was walking around in this thing. Not as big as it is now. <laughs> I, I, I said, are you kidding me? My natural, normal condition is spirit. And I am a huge lump of flesh and blood and muscle and personality and so is everybody I see. And he explains, thank God, to help us, the essence of you is the eternal you, is that spirit. So I, I started to try to sense the essence of me. And it's like Edgar was teaching for you to find your real self. To just, that is the essence, the quintessence, the fundamental motivative spark of your unique being. And so when you look at other people, you have to try to look beyond the physical appearance and the personality. You know, in ancient times, Edgar says, we didn't use personality. That's a projection. He said, you saw the whole soul in ancient times. Um, but eventually, we started to project a portion of ourselves that was a, liked by you. And any of you who have ever dated and then married know exactly what I'm talking about. Personality is a projection, a small projection of your whole self developed by socialization and experience as to what makes other people interested in you, comfortable with you, or get the hell away from you because you don't want them. That's your projected self. But the real you is the individuality behind it. And ultimately the real you is this fundamental essence of your being. And that's our normal natural condition. The only way I found to really get that present in me was through meditation and through watching self go by. Edgar taught us, watch yourself, step back and watch yourself talk and interact with others. Watch yourself talk to yourself, judge yourself, make decisions. When you do that, you're actually starting to get out of the projection and you're back into the deeper self, watching the projection. See how you're, that little teaching of his subtly helps you tap into your bigger self. I love this uh, slide because it really conveys essence, I think. When I found this motion slide, I said, oh my God, that's it. Let's use that. That's the natural condition of us. Now, often spirit or essence is associated with fire. And I think that's interesting because fire is like the life force, metabolism. One of the ways scientists identify whether something's alive is if it has the fire of metabolism. Once it doesn't, it's dead. But as long as it does, it has life. So here are a couple of quotes from scripture to touch on this. I baptize you with water. This is John the Baptist. And Edgar says he went through the initiation with Jesus in Egypt when they were young men. I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. See how spirit and fire are being coordinated. Um, the next one is Jesus meets the woman at the well, and you must understand this woman is not an acceptable woman for someone like Jesus to be talking to. First, she's a Sadducee. That's not even part of the good, pure Jewish race. She also has six husbands and is working on a seventh. <laughs> and uh, seems like modern times, doesn't it? <laughs> um, but you see, her essence is of such a spirituality, despite her physical activities and her physical condition, she draws out of Jesus this major teaching. She says to him, uh, your people teach that we're supposed to worship at the temple in Jerusalem, and my people teach that we're supposed to uh, worship at this well on the mount. And Edgar says to her, God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So see, spirit, your essence, is where you have to get into that condition because that's what's made in the image of God. And truth is that your actions and your thoughts reflect the truth of your spirit. If they don't, you're heading into some conflict and you'll work through it. 
there appeared tongues of fire distributed and resting on each one of them on their crown chakras. This is when Jesus breathed the breath of the Holy Spirit upon them. So here we have tongues of fire over the crown chakra. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So you see how even biblical passages tie into metaphysical, mystical kinds. Uh-oh, here you go. You're going to incarnate. Ah, bam. <laughs> And you quit and get out of here real fast. <laughs> but you have no choice. You're coming back again. <laughs> ah! This time you stay a little longer. You're trapped in your karma a little further. You've gotten lost in one of your weak desires. But bam, your body stops working and you have to leave. Back out again. But you still have unfinished business. <laughs> <laughs> Yep, <laughs> there are big forces working. Now we do this every night. Your light being leaves every night while you, your body's lying in these beds in these houses on the earth. Your light being is allowed to descend, uh, ascend and expand back into celestial realms. In fact, Edgar would sometimes start a reading for a person by saying, oh, here's a soul who was at Arcturus last night. And the lady was... <laughs> Said, no, no, I was in my bed in New Jersey. <laughs> said, ah, but your soul was in the spheres. See how you leave? And of course, on death, you leave the body behind for us to care for, and your light being leaves for good for the end of that incarnation. But each night, Edgar says, this happens, and there's, he was very strong on you learning how to be alive during sleep how to work with your dreams and your visions and your feelings. And when you woke in the morning, he didn't want you to move the body right away. He wanted you to feel the feeling, the essence. And if you had any imagery, he wanted you to capture it, get it in a journal, because you were now experiencing a correlating view from your soul self as to what your physical self was dealing with. Interestingly, scientists have really jumped on this. And at the sleep research centers, at the medical universities around the country, a lot of research has been done on sleep. Interestingly, interestingly, they find that as you're falling asleep in the first hours of the night, you process what had been going on. But if you go past two in the morning, you are starting to foresee the next day and the future and what you might do about it, what, what might happen. So when they wake people up, Prior to that time, usually the person is processing activity and relationships. After that time, usually the person is looking how they might engage activity the next day. So when your light self comes back into your sleeping body in one of these houses, it gets another opportunity to apply its wisdom, its growth, in its relationships to itself and others. Here's Casey's concept of the big motivative pattern. As the entity moves from sphere to sphere, it seeks its way to the home. And if you look at the word home carefully, right in the middle is home. Seeks its way to the home, to the face of the creator, the father, the first cause. Casey identifies the first cause as, quote, that the created would be the companion for the creator. This is the reason we were created, and as a result, the created, our soul, is given opportunities to, quote, show itself to be not only worthy of, but companionable to the creator. Now, we are talking about the creator of the entire universe, and you don't want to be a dull, boring companion. <laughs> so get up and get with it and get involved and... Apply yourself and expand your consciousness, raise your vibrations. You are ultimately destined to be a very interesting companion to the creator of the entire cosmos and everything in it. So really, you should be up and doing and shake off whatever little physical thing is pissing you off. <laughs> now, the celestial beings did incarnate. They come out of the heavens, the light beings, and Edgar says you can find this in the Bible in the book of Job. 
The morning stars sang together and all the children of God shouted for joy at the coming of humanity, he adds. At the time, we thought this was a very interesting place. I don't know how you feel about it now. <laughs> Been here a while, right? Not as thrilling as at first look, huh? <laughs> Edgar Casey says the book of Job was written by the high priest Melchizedek to show every incarnate soul what this world was about. I did not like that. I was in my 20s when I read that, and I thought, oh, God, because I had read the book of Job, and that was not a fun book. And you're telling me that the high priest Melchizedek was showing us what it's like? Well, the book starts out this way. The sons and daughters of God come before God to present themselves, and Satan comes among them. God turns to Satan and says, have you considered my servant Job how good he is? And Satan says, eh, you touch one thing of his physical body or his physical life, he'll curse you to your face. He's not interested in celestial life. He wants two cars in the garage, chicken in the pot, good-looking spouse, money in the bank. <laughs> and then a strange thing happens. God turns to Satan and says, test him. See if that's true. Now, see, in ancient Hebrew mysticism, you have to understand that Satan was the tester. That was his role. Satan was to test you, to help you see if you really are the way you think you are. And so there are tests. So many of us New Agers are so full of karma ideas, we forget the concept that this dimension is about the test. The, you, when you incarnate here, this is a place where you prove whether you really live what you believe. And the very next person that walks up to you is your test. How you respond. And some of your bigger, biggest tests are the people intimately in your lives. They are the biggest. And you are their test too. And you can bring out the best in them or the worst. It's really something. This is the process. We have come here. Of course, Edgar Cayce teaches that the um, first contact was in ancient Mu, which is more popularly called Lemuria, but Edgar says Lemuria was a region of Mu. And this light being essence of ourselves um, came in uh, to physicality. But in Mu, um, Lemuria, a lot of people think that uh, this little lemur uh, is where Lemuria got its name, but not so. There's a Latin origin for lemur that it means ghost. And that's what Casey says Lemuria was all about. There were no physical bodies ready for us. There were no bodies for you to use. And so we manifested as spirits or ghosts. And so Lemuria, you're not going to dig up any bones of Lemurians. Um, Edgar explains that as incarnation developed, we had to develop a physical form. And the spiritual self, the celestial self drawn in this beautiful woodcut, comes in through the crown chakra, or better known as the soft spot or the fontanelle in your baby body. You, your spiritual self came in through that, into this encasement in a physical form. Notice all the power and energy and uplifting, the smile on your face, your heart, and everything. And notice this expression down here. Well, here we are, all by ourselves in one body, and that bugger's falling apart on me. <laughs> here you go with the setup. It's beautifully arranged. The baby body has the fontanelle portal. And you come in through that crown chakra and push yourself into the nervous system. And uh, believe it or not, the uh, ancient uh, symbols that the modern caduceus of the medical profession use actually convey the truth of this. And the medical profession considered this to be a symbol of health and healing. They might have lost the connection uh, with the Shashumna, the Ida and Pingala, and the kundalini life force and the cerebral spinal system and the autonomic, but here it is. The wings are your mind, the disc at the top is your brain, and the uh, orangish yellow shaft is your spinal column. 
So you pushed yourself in and down into the body, a little baby body, you pushed yourself in, you brought all your chemical energy with you, your emotions, your karmic pattern, uh, your desires, your unfulfilled desires, your regrets, your sorrows, your heavy burdens, all with you and push them in. Now you have seven chakras, see the circles are the chakras, which correlate to your seven endocrine glands. You see? So you're pushing into a physical organism that's uh, all set up for metaphysical. Uh, the Yoga Sutras, Patanjali wrote this to show you, yes, it's a great physical organism, but it's secretly designed for metaphysical experience. If you learn the secret pathways and power centers inside the physical organism, you can tell those endocrine glands to drop different hormones. And hormones are powerful forces. Ask any woman in here. <laughs> we men only have to deal with uh, one, but you guys deal with a lot. Um, so this is you pushing into matter into physical form. Are we missing something? Uh, at the front desk now. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so see your cerebral spinal system is the shishumna. Your autonomic nervous system are the double serpents, Ida and Pingala, and that's in the autonomic system, it's divided into sympathetic and parasympathetic. Your sympathetic system is your response system. Uh, so if something occurs that gets you excited, you change the hormones, the sympathetic system's involved. The parasympathetic is when you relax, it starts to rebuild the system, rebalance the system. And you need those two. So suddenly you might be called to action or you might get excited, sympathetic hormones are dropped. Parasympathetic will jump in when you take a break or it's all over and it starts to rebalance the body for you. These are all parts of the power force within you, and they are symbolized in the medical symbol for health and well-being. Another thing you need to know is that you are not your whole self. If you look at Genesis, in Genesis 1, Elohim is the, word, the Hebrew word used to create us. We are created in the image of Elohim. In chapter 2, we're created a second time by Yahweh Elohim, which an English Bible will call Lord God. Dust of the earth breathes the breath of life, we become incarnate. But our essence was made in chapter 1, in the image of the ultimate creator. Do you see? Now we're made dust of the earth. You see? Well, the, if you read Genesis carefully, the Lord finds out this is lonesome. These celestial beings are now trapped in one individual body. So when you get to uh, chapter 2, verse 18, God decides, Yahweh Elohim decides, they need companionship here and divides us into one aspect of the two aspects that make up our soul. Our soul is both feminine and masculine, yin and yang. So we, he reaches in and pulls out kava, which in Hebrew means the life giver, and the Hebrew word for rib is the same word for side. One side of our being, the feminine side. What really gets me is when they describe the Ark of the Covenant, they use the exact same word for the sides of the Ark, and they don't use the word rib in translating it. That really bugs me. They should have used side in Genesis if they're gonna use that Hebrew word. So now you pull out the feminine and the masculine and they are companions one to another, but it means I'm not whole. Uh, the depth psychologist Carl Jung said to us, John, if you wanna get in touch with your full consciousness, you gotta tap into your feminine. And ladies, if you wanna get in touch with your full consciousness, you have to tap into your Right, you're masculine. Why? Because we've actually been separated and we're projecting only half of ourselves. Now, it doesn't mean that I become feminine. No, not at all. In touch with the feminine. And a woman still is a woman and feminine, but she's in touch with the masculine side. Now your whole consciousness is working together. These divisions are very important to be aware of. 
And here you see a drawing of Shiva and Shakti up there. Shiva and Shakti showing the oneness of the two sides of herself. And here's the yin yang symbol, very ancient symbol, goes back to 5000 BC. Now, here's something we got to touch on because everybody gets too hot for this, uh, especially when I was younger. I had all my buddies running off with soulmates. This one lady came to Edgar Casey and asked if her soulmate was incarnate at the same time she was, and he replied from trance, yes, about 30 of them. <laughs> that would have spared you a lot of trouble, right? If you had read that reading. <laughs> Yep, believe it or not, Edgar Casey says a soulmate is a soul with whom you have traveled a lot. And he said choosing the right soulmate was a matter of what your ideals were. What is your ideal than among the potential soulmates out there who has an ideal that complements that ideal? But I will point out to you that that was not easy for me. What was my ideal and your ideal at 18 years of age? at 28 years of age, at 38, at 48. Do you see how it changes? Wow, no wonder we got issues, you know. <laughs> if they don't grow with you, you can see what the problem's going to develop here. But Edgar points out that having a soulmate doesn't mean you're thrilled with every aspect of the person. It means you two know each other a lot. There might be areas in which you really are upset with one another and other areas where you are natural, intimate, vibrationally harmonic companions. Do you see that? But your true ultimate mate is the source of your life, your creator. You're to be the companion of the creator. And if in your mates that you're with physically here, you can help both of you get in touch with that, then things really are strong and good. <clears throat> okay, we come in with a lot of energy and a lot of energy forces that you need to be aware of. And men, this uh, circular disc here is not a skill saw blade. <laughs> it's a chakra. <laughs> This is Vishnu, and he's showing all the forces, the lotus blossom, the chakra, the conch shell with that great sound that sort of haunts you with like ohm sound, but also inside has the spinning uh, qualities of an evolving experience and free will that cuts both ways. Here you see Casey describe the original intention. The intention was to be able to partake of the physical, but not be a part of same. More and more feeding upon those sources from which you emanate, feeding upon those, budgeting time to be in the spirit, to be in touch with the creative forces or the spiritual life, so that the physical body, the mental body are attuned to your soul forces, your soul source, your creator your maker, in such a way and manner as you develop. That was the intention. Of course, we've got a lot of other things that we're into. Of course, Atlantis came along and was a great period of time. The Atlanteans had many powerful technologies here. We'll uh, I'll just read a few that Casey said Atlanteans could take photographs of people in places not in sight of the camera equipment. <laughs> They had equipment that could view through walls even at great distances. Atlanteans had crafts that overcame the forces of gravity without using combustion or fossil fuels. Using crystals, they were able to channel the rays, heat, light, and cosmic rays from the sun and other stars, including Arcturus, in a manner that gave them unlimited energy and diverse types of power. The crystals also, Casey says, served as communication devices from the unseen dimensions of the cosmos into the physical word of, uh, world of incarnate beings as sound waves. Casey said it this way, quote, as sound from the outer realm to the static or individual realm. He said that the facets of the crystal also captured and channeled heat from within the earth, not just from the stellar realms. Um, the crystals, uh, in combination with the gases and steams from within the planet, were used to produce light, heat, electricity, and the propulsion necessary to move people from place to place, including into outer space. The crystals were also used to rejuvenate physical bodies, 
keeping uh, Atlanteans young and healthy for as long as their souls wanted to be incarnate. One Atlantean physician priestess, they usually had multiple qualities to them, lived 8,000 years. That's without illness or deterioration of her bodily function, too. Now, that's the way you'd like to grow old, right? <laughs> Living a long time, you know, sounds good, but the last 10 years can be hell. <laughs> <laughs> Just look around a little bit. Talk to a few of your elders. My uh, mom and dad are 95 and 94. Dad plays golf twice a week. But he still whines to me about all the things that don't work anymore. Uh, we all can't wait for that to be available again. All was fine in Atlantis until those less than ideal intentions and understandings began to use the crystals and other machines in ways that were not in harmony with the creative forces or nature. Casey said that uh, they tuned the etheric rays through the facets in a manner that generated volcanic upheavals so great that the massive continent separated into five uh, island regions. Here's his map of the ancient world that you originally came in. Of course, Atlantis fits with the name of the ocean over there. And Mu and Lemuria here. These lines are the UN's... Uh, island nation borders uh, so ignore them they don't have it but I get a kick out of the fact Edgar said the west coast of the US was la la land <laughs> we still call it that I thought man he's right on of course Indochina was La Mu and you can see how he named different places and all and these were the ancient realms and of course we know about tectonic plates separating and all so the changes occurred. Here's his breakdown of a shift that occurred. Uh, the Maya talk about it this way. The children of God came to Mother God and say, Mom, we're in trouble. This place has us all screwed up. And she says, uh, okay, we're going to have to have a powwow. And I'm going to need your help on this. And so the children said, well, the biggest problem are the five senses. We really get excited by them, and they possess us. And she said, okay, we'll divide into five groups, and each one of the groups will take one of the five senses to perfect. These groups became the five races. Now, Edgar says you shouldn't focus, as we do today, on race, but on the energetics of the two and the geographical location, because that determined the pigment, but not race in the sense we see it. So here's his layout uh, of Mother God, of the Mayan Mother God, of the five tribes. The yellow race was in Mu and Gobi, and hearing was the, uh, they all had all five senses, but these guys were going to perfect hearing. Brown race was the Andes. I was surprised by that, but that's what he said. Scent, uh, olfactory nerve, smelling. Red race was Atlantis. Now, I know some people publish white race, but not according to Casey. The Atlanteans were the red race. Touch and feeling. Black race was Nubia, which today would be Upper Egypt, uh, Sudan, Ethiopia, Nubia. And Nubia was the land of gold. All the gold in Egypt came out of Nubia. And it's tasting, taste. White race were out of the Caucasus Mountains. That's why they're called Caucasians. Seeing uh, was the one. Now, interestingly, in order to have the five races, we needed five Eves. The first five mothers. And this is a fascinating idea that was developed. There had to be the five Eves. And what's interesting is that some science now some of it fringe science, but some of it legitimate, is starting to focus on a little symbiote that travels within us, mitochondria and mitochondrial DNA. In Star Wars, they were afraid to use that name, so they used metachlorian. <laughs> so they would measure your metachlorian count. But here's mitochondrial DNA, a better written mtDNA, and they notice that haplogroups have certain mitochondria you can only trace mitochondria to the through the female line the five eves and they notice that if you in the uh, south pacific south america etc you find more of haplogroup b which would be mu and lemuria migrations 
Haplogroup X, the Atlantean migrations, are found in the Royal Iroquois, the Basque people, Brazilians, etc. Now, Edgar actually came out and, and was asked, uh, what's, who are the remnant of the Atlanteans? And he said, well, one of them is the Royal Iroquois. Now, if you study the Royal Iroquois, they're matriarchal. I go and live in my mother-in-law's house. <laughs> matriarchal. Do you know the Hopi? Matriarchal. I uh, lead tours for ARE, and we did our tour up to the Hopi uh, Second Mesa, and I was up there sitting around with all the honcho males, and I was saying, so you guys are kind of the chiefs of all of this? And their heads dropped a little bit. I said, what's that mean? So, well, you see, uh, the women own all the property, <laughs> and there is one woman who leads the whole thing, and when they want to divorce you, all they have to do is put your clothes outside their house. <laughs> I thought that was so cool. <laughs> so then I met with the head female. Do you see Edgar Casey said the same thing? Prior to the great flood, feminine was dominant. And when he would be giving a past life reading and going through their past lives, if he went past the great flood, suddenly the women were all in charge. They were the leaders and he would be talking about them. So uh, then after the great flood, masculine energy was a dominant and now Edgar says we're coming into an era when they're going to be balanced and yeah and spooky enough he said in the future a long future your bodies are going to rebalance into having both male and female parts and energy like they did in Atlantis in early Atlantis um, you actually, if one of the members of your soul group wanted to come in, you actually could conceive within your own body because you had both the womb and the male energy and give birth to a physical vehicle one of them could incarnate in. They were androgynous bodies, hermaphroditic. And he says that he and his twin soul, I'll explain more of this tomorrow, are going to reincarnate in 2,158 in one of these new type of bodies. Yikes. Well, you know, it sounds real weird, but do you know when I uh, went and talked with the medical researchers, they revealed to me that one out of every 2,000 births of human bodies, the genitalia are ambiguous. We have both. Yikes. Now, in the Caribbean, they don't care. They let the baby grow. In the U.S., you can't go into the waiting room and dad will say, what do I have? And you say, what do you want? <laughs> he goes, what? <laughs> we can give you either one. Tell us which one you want. <laughs> oh, God. <clears throat> so I saw a news uh, interview with a young Caribbean man and his wife. He was 26 years old and their two children. They were very balanced, very much in love, very typical. But he was born, both genitalia present. And his mother wanted a girl so bad, up to the age of 80, went to, a school, to school as a girl. And then one day he came home with a little deeper voice and a little more hair and said, Mom, I'm really a guy. So they dressed him as a guy and he went to school the next day as a guy. I'd like to be a fly on the wall when he walked in. <laughs> And his body started to secrete all the masculine hormones naturally. He became a normal male, subdued the feminine, and married this young lady, had two normal children. See? But in our country, we have to do surgery because we just aren't comfortable with leaving it strange. Um, though that may change as things continue. But I just thought that was a good example to show you of how much bigger the picture is of us and our celestial nature, then we might realize. And tomorrow I'm going to take this further and take you into uh, more detail in everything. But uh, I think this is enough for today. Um, you are star beings temporarily sojourning physically. Thank you. Another round of applause for John Van
Everyone you fight And all that is now 